I just want to introduce our guest speaker. I, I met Dr. Keith. I kind of call him Dr. Keith because he's one of our professors in our seminary class. I feel bad. Just, just you know, yes, he's a pastor, church plan, all that, but he's doctor. He's helping a brother, help a brother. And so I knew, met Dr. Keith uh, back when we were a part of a, a, a athletic ministry it's called Champions for Christ and him being basketball and football. And we all know football is a you know, much better sport. So, you know, we'll get to all of that later. <laughs> But, you know, just, just but I want to give him his accolades right now. He says, we are part of a global movement of churches. Maybe some of you know that or not. But Pastor Keys comes and this weekend, and he and Jennifer, they did something special for us as a church. They did two things, and I, I really received this and believe that this happened. They came here, and they equipped us, and they also came here to impart some things into us to help us uh, further reach this city. And so thank you for that, uh, for serving us and blessing us. And Pastor Keith Towers, the senior pastor of High Point Church in Orlando, Florida. Keith holds a master's degree in counseling and has been a mental health counselor in private practice for 20 years. Keith has provided a, a mental health seminars for churches around the world and is the author of the Mental Health for Spiritual People. Keith is currently a Ph.D. candidate in organizational leadership and is the professor of our apostolic leadership and the, the Every Nation Seminary along with Jennifer, lovely wife. They've been married for 30 years. Come on, somebody, 30 years. And Pastor Keith leads the marriage and parenting seminars around the world. Prior to pastoring and counseling, Keith played for professional basketball for seven years for the Orlando Magic, the Los Angeles Clippers, and the Milwaukee Bucks. But I will not say what the, what the college that he went to, because, you know, that, that college that he went to is, you know, I, I'm not, without further ado, I just want to bring up Pastor <laughs> Keith Tower. <laughs> wow. Foot, football's a better sport than basketball, huh? I mean, I guess that's true when your team is Notre Dame and not Penn State. Yes, indeed. Sorry for yelling that, but... Notre Dame is awesome. All right. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, wow. What a privilege to be with you, Every Nation, New York City. I have admired you as a church for a number of years from afar, and it's a great privilege uh, to be able to stand before you and open God's word. I want to thank and honor your pastors for the privilege of, of getting to stand here and speak with this amazing people. Um, church, you're strong. You're healthy. I've had the privilege to be around many of you. And can I tell you, as a church, you're not normal. <laughs> you know, when you're a part of something amazing, you just, you just start thinking like every church is like this. And you are an extraordinary people because you have extraordinary leaders. Your pastors love you. Your pastors care for you. Your, your pastors are on their face before God for you. Your pastors are some of the most authentic leaders who you see up here is who they are behind closed doors. And they care about you. And at the same time, they walk this incredible balance where you are at the top of mind and simultaneously they're obsessed with the next you who's not here yet. That's a difficult balance to walk. Some pastors are like, yeah, glad you're here and they're out there. Other pastors love their holy huddle, and they don't neglect you in any way, and yet they're willing to keep you mobilized about the other 12 million people that are around here that desperately need what you have. They're extraordinary leaders, and you are a blessed, blessed people, and it is a privilege to be able to open God's word with you. As, uh, as Pastor Shino mentioned, I played uh, in the NBA for a number of years, I played with the Orlando Magic. I was the backup to raise your hand, just kind of trying to see who knows who, who is for Shaquille O'Neal. Anybody heard of Shaquille O'Neal? Okay, I was Shaq's backup, which means I didn't play much. Right? <laughs> I mean, I had to guard him every day in practice for two years. So I got like the short end of that stick. And then game time, you know, the coach is like, let's see, who should play at center today? Tower O'Neal, eeny, meeny, my <laughs> Mo always fell on Shaq, right? So I didn't, I didn't get to play much, but I did get to play at the most important time. When I was playing back in the 90s, you know, when basketball was a man's sport, right? It was just, it was physical and the games were low scoring and it was a different game than it is now. If you got 100 points, man, that was like, nobody got 100 points. 
But we had a promotion with McDonald's in our city that if we scored 110 and won, everybody in the arena got a free Big Mac. Now to score 110 and win means like you blew the other team out, which means it's like, let's get Shaq out of the game so he doesn't get hurt, right? And let's put Tower in because who cares, right? So, so I would play during this promotion when we were way ahead. And when, it, when it, they called the promotion the Mac Attack, and when we would get to 100 points, the announcer would come on and go, 10 points for the Mac attack. And everybody would scream and yell, because to get your free Big Mac, you had to stay to the end of the game. Which means I would get in and get to play in front of a full arena, which was unheard of. <laughs> so, you know, we'd score our basket, 102 points, eight points for the Mac attack. I checked in one game, we were at 106 points, four points for the Mac attack. But there's probably, uh, 10 seconds at the most left. So there's really no way we're gonna get to the Mac attack. We had the ball, but there's no way we're gonna get there. So we, we throw it in, our guy comes down and scores real quick. 108 points, two points for the Mac attack. Now we're under five seconds, so typically the other team would let the ball just kind of bounce out of bounds, take their L and go home. But for whatever reason, their guy picks it up and throws it in. And the guy he throws it to, and there's virtually no time left, he takes off up the court. Now when you, I wouldn't say never, when you rarely play, if there's an opportunity to get an actual real live statistic, like you go for it. So in the NBA, every shot has to have a rebound counted to it. So I'm like, man, if this guy's gonna run up and just launch like a half court shot, I'm gonna run down and get the rebound. So I go running down, Clock's winding down, the guy throws it up, the ball bounces off, and with two tenths of a second left, I get a rebound. <laughs> and they foul me. <laughs> Which means I have two free throws <laughs> with 20,000 Big Macs hanging in the balance. <laughs> So I, and I'm way down at the other end and I've got to walk all the way down there. And it was, the, it was like the weirdest, most surreal moment. I start walking down the court and there was just like this, this murmur that goes up through the crowd. Now, normally when you're playing, you're focused, you're not listening to that, but I'm kind of like, ooh, I wonder what they're saying about me. So there's this whisper as I'm walking down the court, this murmur goes up and I'm listening and they're going, who is that? <laughs> so, so I get to like half, half court and they're like, Tower, Thompson, Toner? Like, and, and then I start getting closer to the free throw line and they can finally read my name and all of a sudden the whole arena just, just starts going like this. Tower, Tower, <laughs> Tower. I get closer to the free throw line, now they're getting loud. Tower, Tower, Tower. I step right up to the free throw line. Tower, the referee hands me the ball and whoosh, goes deathly silent. <laughs> Now you need to know this about me. <laughs> I am clutch under pressure. Okay, just want you to know. <laughs> Ball goes in, 109 points. One point for the Mac attack. Woo. The place goes absolutely crazy. They're standing on their feet, screaming my name. One lady over here yells, Tower, will you marry me? <laughs> I'm like, yo, raise your standards, it's a hamburger, it's not even Chick-fil-A. <laughs> like, serious? I mean, if it was a New York bagel, okay, I mean, I can see it, but it's a hamburger. Place is going absolutely nuts. I'm the most popular guy, maybe in the city of Orlando, certainly in the arena. 20,000 brand new friends, they love me, I'm sure, for who I am, deeply in my own heart. And they are screaming, now they're standing on their feet. Tower, tower, tower. And I got one more shot left. I step up to the free throw line, tower. They hand me the ball and shh. Now you need to know this about me. <laughs> I've played in the NBA playoffs. I've played in March Madness in college. Played in a state championship in high school. And I have never been more nervous for an absolutely meaningless free throw than I was for that. But I'm clutch. <laughs> All right.
I missed. <laughs> and I lost 20,000 brand new friends. <laughs> just like that. They're no longer, no more marriage proposals. They're cursing me, cursing my wife, cursing my mom, cursing my dog. I'm like, it's a hamburger. Relax. Oh. No longer the most popular guy in the arena. Quite possibly the least popular guy in the arena. Oh. And it's amazing what a little bit of stress will do, isn't it? Your pastor asked me to talk about mental health. And I thought, well, New York City, we can go a lot of different directions. How about we talk about being stressed out? Right. Does that work for you? Yes. Now, you need to understand this. I, I have shot probably close to a million free throws. Hundreds of thousands. I, 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 all alone in the gym, in the driveway growing up with my brother, out at the park with, in the, as, the, as the, the sun is setting. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of free throws. I have done this literally probably a million times. And you put a little pressure like a hamburger. <laughs> okay, 20,000 hamburgers. I mean, <laughs> let's see you do that, right? So, but you, you, put, you put just, a, just an, a, an added bit of stress, and it's amazing how stress will affect your performance. Something I've done so often now becomes difficult just with a little bit of added stress. And as we're talking about mental health and what we're talking about anxiety and being stressed out today, you might be tempted to say like, like why are we talking about this in church? <laughs> right, isn't this just a, a, a spiritual endeavor? Shouldn't we just be talking about the Bible? Which we will. Shouldn't we just be talking by faith? Yes, we will, but your pastors care about the whole you. You are spiritual people, but you're not only spiritual people. That's right. That's right. Your body, soul, and spirit, and they care about who you are as a whole integrated human being. Mm -hmm. So while we're going to get into God's word and address this from a spiritual perspective, we're also going to be talking about your mental and emotional well-being because stress affects our performance. We're going to look today, actually, before we do that, I want to put this quote up by Albert Ellis. When we think of this idea about talking about mental health in a church perspective, Albert Ellis wrote, I think that I can safely say that the Judeo-Christian Bible is a self-help book that has probably enabled more people to make more extensive and intensive personality and behavioral change than all professional therapists combined. Wow. That is an extraordinary statement from a man who was just voted the number three most influential person in the history of the field of psychology, only behind Carl Rogers and Sigmund Freud. And he says, this book, the pages of scripture have done more to transform people externally and internally than all of counseling, his field combined. Oh, fun fact, interesting, interestingly, Albert Ellis is a professing atheist, which means he doesn't even believe or trust in the pages of the book that he's saying are helpful. That's why he refers to them as a self-help book, whereas you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus, you understand they're not just a self-help book, they're the words of life. They are written by the author and perfecter of our faith. They are the pillar and foundation upon which we stand. And they, 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 are the, they are the very fabric by which our mind is renewed and our entire being is transformed. No wonder even to an atheist, it works. Uh -huh. We're going to be looking today at one of the most common, and honestly, one of the most commonly misunderstood and misapplied scriptures on mental and emotional health today as we talk about being stressed out. It's a text that's often offered for comfort, but when it's improperly applied, it actually amplifies the anguish that it was meant to relieve. We're going to be in Philippians chapter 4 today, we're going to read Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9, written by the Apostle Paul. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4, goes like this. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say it, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, 
but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. This is kind of the big dog scripture on dealing with anxiety in all the Bible. And as we're going to unpack it here for a minute, I want to explain some things that are true about humanity, which will help us properly apply this text to our own lives and to those that we're trying to be helpful toward. Some things that are true about humanity that the Apostle Paul understood and we need to is that we are made in the image of God. You're made in the image of God. What, what, what does that mean? That God is seven feet tall, slightly balding, and dashingly handsome? <laughs> I mean, he's God, why not, right? <laughs> no, it, it, it doesn't mean that God looks like us. What, what it means is we are made in the same essence, the very same nature of God, in the way that, that he is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Three distinct persons, yet no distinction between them. Like he's, he's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, three separate and yet distinct, yet fully united, completely integrated. He's one being with three persons, but he's not three, he's only one. It's the mystery of the Trinity. And when you look at the composition of every man, woman, and child, we, we, we see this three in one all throughout us. In fact, your personality is a three-in-one integration made in the image of God. Your personality is simply this. It is a combination, a constant fluid interplay of your behaviors, your actions, your thoughts, your mind, and your feelings, your emotions. You and I interact with life situations through a constant fluid interplay between behaviors or actions, thoughts, our mind, and feelings are emotions. If it was suddenly cold in here, right? We're, we're interacting with life, you feel cold. So you slip on your jacket and you think, I can't wait to go outside because it's gonna be 80 degrees today. Right, so we, we, we feel, we, we behave, we interact. Every life situ situation that comes our way, we're, we, we have this fluid interplay between feelings, thoughts, and behaviors. Now, of those three, you only have the ability to directly control two. And then there's one you can't directly control. You have the ability to directly control your behaviors, your actions, right? We know this practically. If I were to say, hey, raise your right hand, assuming that your right arm is functional, you would be able to raise it. You'd be able to stand up. You'd be able to blink your left eye. You'd be able to tap dance if you can do that, right? Like there's behaviors. You can make a conscious choice to do things. We know this practically, but we also know this biblically because scripture commands us to do things. It tells us how we're supposed to act and how we're supposed to behave. It's called lordship, that I would take scripture and do it, live it the way it's commanded of me. And in fact, Paul tells us that there are, there are fruits of the Spirit, a, a life that, is, that does what Scripture says to do produces something, and one of these fruits of the Spirit is what's called self-control, the capacity to control oneself. So the more I do what the Bible tells me to do, the more I have the ability to continually choose to do what the Bible tells me to do. I can choose to behave a certain way. I actually have the ability to directly control how I think as well. We know this biblically, right? Scripture tells us to take every thought captive and make it obedient to the will of Christ, which simply means that if, I'm, if I have a kind of a rabbit trail thought that's sort of going over here, I can kind of grab that thought and bring it back and I can make it obedient to the will of Christ. This is what God's word says. How does that thought line up? And if that thought doesn't line up, I can actually choose to discard that thought and choose instead to think in accordance with scripture. We know that theologically, but let's just prove it. I can tell by some of your faces. Let's prove it practically. <laughs> we'll do a little thought experiment. Close your eyes if you would. 
Close your eyes. I know we're in New York. No one's going to pick your pocket. It's okay. <laughs> Close your eyes. When I count to three, I want you to think of an apple. Use your brain to form the mental image of an apple. Are you ready? One, two, three. Okay, open your eyes. Every one of you was capable of thinking of an apple. Now, it might be a different form of an apple based on your experience, but you could form the mental image, perhaps, of that beautiful red fruit, right? Or maybe you prefer the golden delicious, so your apple was, you know, just large and golden. I can tell some of you probably thought of your computer, right? But either way, you, you're able to form any mental image. You can directly control how you think, and you can directly control how you act and behave what you do not have the ability to do is directly control your emotions. You don't control how you feel. Theologically, nowhere in scripture are you commanded to feel a certain way. Your feelings are actually a response to your behaviors and to your thoughts. Your feelings respond to your actions and the way your mind works. They respond. You don't have a direct, even in scripture, if you find something that looks like it's telling you to feel a certain way, it's actually telling you, how to behave right after it, what to do to feel this way. But just practically, because some of you are like, no, that ain't right. Here's what I want you to do. We're gonna close our eyes again. We're gonna do another thought experiment. When I count to three, what I want you to do is to feel happy. Super happy. Super duper happy. We're gonna feel unbelievably happy at the count of three. Are you ready to feel happy at three? Ready, one, two, stop. What are you doing right now? You're thinking happy thoughts. Oh, my birthday. Oh, we're going to lunch later. Oh, last night with the ladies event. Oh, this friend I'm sitting next to. You're thinking happy thoughts. And I can tell you this, many of you started doing the behaviors that a happy person does. You started smiling. You sat up a little bit straighter. Your chin went a little bit higher and you started to smile. You weren't yet happy, but you tried to move the needle on your happiness by doing something and thinking something because your emotions are a response to your behaviors and your thoughts. You don't have a, you didn't, you didn't like go to your internal brain and go sad, happy, sad, happy. There's no, there's no slider there. And you know that if you've ever struggled with, with, with depression, which is just basically a deep and enduring sadness, and someone comes and goes, come on, man, cheer up. Like, I would if I could. If I had a gauge that could go, happy, do you think I would choose this? You know if you've been anxious and stressed and you feel like you're on the verge of panic and someone comes with the well-intended device of like, hey, man, just relax. I don't have that slider. <laughs> I don't have the ability to directly change my emotions. How I do change my emotions though, because they're a response to my behaviors and my thoughts, is I think and behave in such a way that moves my emotions because your personality, while being three, much like Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, indistinguishably, indistinguishably integrated, your personality fights like crazy when it's healthy to stay integrated. What I mean by that is if you're in a situation that would cause sadness and your mood goes to sad, it'll show in your countenance. And it'll show in your thinking. Or if you're remembering a loved one or something like that, or the day your dog passed away, you, you're, you're thinking about it and it actually shows in your behavior and you start to feel sad. A healthy personality fights to stay integrated. Even if it's in the depths of despair, your thoughts, behaviors, and emotions will stay tightly wound when you're healthy. When they disintegrate, when they pull apart, it's actually what we call a personality disorder. To where I, I'm, if you saw the movie The Joker, right? The, the, I haven't seen the second one, the first one was amazing with Joaquin Phoenix. It is one of the most brilliant acting performances of a personality disorder. And here's what I mean by that. He is in these just gut-wrenchingly, agonizingly, horrifically sad situations. Terribly sad. And he laughs. And 
it is disturbing to see. Because when someone is in a terribly sad situation, like the, it, it shows on their countenance in a way that looks sad and their thoughts match them there. But when he's, you know, because you're watching this situation and he expresses verbally that he's sad and then he, then he laughs, which is what somebody in, in captured by joy does. And you can't help but go, uh, mm, something's not right here. Because a healthy personality codes this, and when it sees that, it goes, warning, Will Robinson, it shouldn't look like this. So what do we do? What does this have to do with anything? I'll tell you. Let's take the emotion of depression. If I'm feeling depression, which is prolonged and extended and deep sadness, while I'm feeling that, and my personality wants to stay integrated, eventually, my behavior is gonna to start to reflect the emotion that I'm feeling. So while I'm feeling just so blah, and honestly dark on the inside, I actually start to change my environment around me. I draw all the shades. I sit in dark rooms. I, I disconnect from people who usually bring me joy. I, I stop engaging in, in things that were fun for me because my behavior starts to match my mood. In fact, it becomes very difficult not just to not do fun things, but to do any things. It's hard to get out of bed. It's hard to take care of the children. The dishes start piling up. It's hard to brush your teeth. It's hard to care for yourself. It's hard to find the energy to do anything because your behavior matches your mood and it's not long before your thoughts integrate there as well. And you go from thinking like, well, maybe tomorrow will be a better day to start wondering if tomorrow will be better if you're not in it. Is there any point to any of this? And while depression is very dangerous, it's actually a sign of at least a healthy, integrated personality. Well, how do I change that? Well, just feel better. Cheer up, buddy. It, if I had a gauge, I would. I can't directly control my emotions. Little side note, because you can't directly control your emotions, it's also why follow your heart is really bad advice. Because you have no say where it's going. You're actually supposed to live by faith and follow scripture and think in accordance with the word, not be led by your heart. You have no idea where it's going to take you. So if my mood is down, how do I change it? Well, one of the things I can do is I can force my thinking to change. If I'm looking at tomorrow thinking that it's pointless, I could actually open the word of God and see that God's mercies are new tomorrow. They're new every morning. And if I'm starting to wonder whether the world is better without me in it, I can actually read and meditate on this word that says I am fearfully and wonderfully made and that God has a purpose and a plan for my life. And if I can sustain this thinking, my personality will not stay disintegrated very long and my mood will move. Now that's tough in the depths and the grips of depression to sustain thinking, but it's also why we want to be transformed by renewing of our mind Get in this Bible, see what God says is true and hold fast to it and I can move my mood or my thinking's gonna go back. And in that case, I would just, now I can move my behavior. So we typically do in treating people with depression is we'll go into their almost cave-like environment that they've created and we will pull back the curtains and we're gonna let light in. We're gonna do what people who aren't depressed do. We're going to let sunshine in. We're going to get you out of bed. Even if you don't have the strength, I'm going to get you up. We're going to get you out of your jammies. We're going to get you dressed and we are going to go outside and walk for just five minutes. We're going to do things that are inconsistent with how you feel. And at some point you reintegrate in a healthier place. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay, keep that in mind, and that will help you properly apply this scripture to your own well-being and to those that you want to help. Let's go back to Philippians chapter 4. We'll start in verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. 
You might be tempted to think that that's a command to feel a certain way, but it's actually not. Rejoice is not an emotion, it's an action. It's a choice to do something. It's a choice to live toward God in a Godward orientation whereby I'm quick to thank, I'm quick to yield, I'm quick to celebrate, I'm quick to surrender. I live every day with a front of mind, just awareness, with this front of mind cognition that God is great and that God is for you. I live knowing that to be true, thought. And I am gonna actually live as if it's true. Which means when something amazing happens, it's just quick to be thankful. When something very difficult happens, I can, I can be thankful and I can celebrate and I can yield to God's hand. When I choose to live that way, rejoice always. And just in case you didn't hear him, he's gonna say it again, because it's tough sometimes. Rejoice. Live this way way, oh, by the way, even when you don't feel like it. Even when you don't feel like it. Because if you live that way, you'll start to feel like it. And it can feel hypocritical. Well, shouldn't I, you know, if I don't feel like that, why should I do that? And here's the thing, you are not supposed to live. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, that we are to live by faith not by sight. Faith is simply that, that I believe thought, that God's word is true, therefore I'm gonna obey it, action. And this amazing thing has happened, if I believe it to be true and I live according to it, I now start to actually feel right toward it. So we live by faith. I live by my behaviors governed under Jesus. I live by my mind govern under his word. And I don't worry about how I feel. I do what scripture says to do. It goes on in verse five and says, let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Even when you're feeling stressed out, even when you're feeling anxious, even when you can feel anxiety rise, you and I should not live as a stressed out people. Don't do the behaviors of one who's anxious. What do anxious people do? We lash out. We snap. We lay on our horn. We flip people the bird in traffic, right? Don't do what stressed people do. Do what is gentle all the time toward everyone. So I'm going to change my actions toward being a gentleman, even when I feel like not being gentle toward you. And what will happen is I will not be as stressed as I was if I gave full vent to it. And it says, the Lord is at hand. Which means, when I don't feel like being gentle, God is right next to me anyway, which means I can actually access his grace to live the way he tells me to live. That's right. It's not like I gotta, you know, like, like lasso heaven and, and go, okay, God, you better give me some strength. It, it literally says, when I'm making a choice to live with the fruit of the Spirit, which is gentleness, one of them, when I'm choosing to live a life governed under the thoughts and behaviors of God, man, he's, he's right there fanning the flame, allowing me to do and be what I don't feel like doing and being, and honestly, what the situation wouldn't warrant. Just don't act like anxious people. I've got friends in the Navy SEALs and they have a saying amongst the special forces, when the going gets tough, the tough relax. Mm. <laughs> and here's what they do. When the bullets start flying, they don't act like people who are being shot at. The very first thing they do is they stop, they take a breath, they look at each other and go, are you good? I'm good. You good? You good? Weapons good? All right. 
Let's go get these fools. <laughs> Rather than going, wah, and freak out, and now have an inability. Gosh, listen. I missed a free throw for hamburgers. <laughs> what is it like to have bullets flying by you? If stress threw off something I've done a million times, what would it do in the heat of battle to your performance? They, they actually practice a mindful gentleness before their savagery. And it allows them to be incredibly effective. Because they do and think before they feel. And when we find a situation that would cause us to feel, stop. Now you might be thinking, well that just feels inauthentic. There's this, if I may just have two extra seconds to my message, there's this thing in the body of Christ and in the world today about authenticity. I'm just being me and my most authentic self. Well, that is not actually how we're supposed to live. We're supposed to live according to scripture. And we can think, if I'm feeling anxious, I just need to give full vent because that's authentic. That is not authentic, that's rude. Great. What's authentic is if you are a follower of Jesus to authentically follow Jesus in the way that you think and in the way that you act. That's authentic. If you're a person of faith, live by faith. Do what he says and do what he tells you to think regardless of how you feel. That's actually more authentic than giving vent to your feelings. Okay, rant done. And it says, let your gentleness be known to all men, which means we need to do this consistently. In every setting, the more you practice gentleness when other people's emotions are getting amped up, the more uh, you will uh, overcome anxiety. Come on, students. Finals week. Is there anything worse than being around other students in finals week for your own personal anxiety? You're worried about your test, and they're talking about how worried they are about you. Now you're worried about everybody's test. <laughs> right? Anxiety's contagious. But if you just decide, I'm going to be gentle, you know what I'm going to do? Rather than getting freaking out with them, I'm going to pray with them, and I'm going to let my gentleness go out on them. You, it'll actually calm your own heart. Okay, let's keep moving. Passage goes on in verse 6 and says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Go back to verse 6, if you would, and let's leave it there for a quick second. Be anxious for nothing. Few things will make you more anxious than struggling with anxiety and somebody well-meaning, loving you, handing you a scripture that tells you God doesn't want you to be anxious. Because now, not only am I anxious, I'm disobeying God who's telling me not to feel this way. Right, that actually spikes your anxiety. God doesn't want me to be anxious and I don't know how to stop and he's telling me how to feel. He's actually not telling you how to feel there. He's telling you how you can not feel. He's, this passage is telling us about, about a possible way of being based on what you do and what you think. Be anxious for nothing. It's not, it's not you know, sometimes we help people with take two scriptures and call me in the morning and God's word is loving and good and amazing and helpful, but it's meant to be applied with action and with thought. And be anxious for nothing is, is, is the first phrase in an incredibly powerful statement Paul's making. Be anxious for nothing, but, but, it's a key phrase that's going to tell us how I can live the way that it just said I could. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Sometimes we're helpful because we hand them this passage that says be anxious for nothing to someone who's struggling with anxiety or then we take the second part and go, well, just pray about it. 
And if I'm feeling anxious and I start asking God to take away my anxiety and I pray, Lord, help me not be anxious, Lord, help me not be anxious, and I get a bunch of people praying around me about me not being anxious, you know what? If that anxiety doesn't leave, I'm more anxious and condemned. Because if God really loved me, he would take away my anxiety that everybody's praying for, so he must not see me, hear me, and stress goes way up. Except for this passage is actually not telling you to pray about your anxiety. It's telling you to pray about everything that causes anxiety. It's telling you to pray, which is an action, about everything, which you've got to kind of think through what everything includes. And to bring those things with thanksgiving in my heart, with, through the action of petition, which is enumerating, it's this, it's this, it's this. I am to pray those, which is a verbal action. I'm going to bring things to God. So I don't pray about how I feel. I, I pray about those things as I think through it that are causing me to feel this way. We have two daughters, they're both grown-ups, adult daughters, and they live on their own. One lives in Washington, D.C. One lives in Honolulu, Hawaii. We live in Orlando, Florida. They were a long way for a Papa Bear kind of dad. If something were to go wrong with my daughter in Honolulu, uh, I have to sit on an airplane for 11 hours to even get there. And sometimes that makes me worry. It causes me some anxiety. And sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night unable to sleep because I'm having the emotion of anxiety, which is causing a physiological reaction, which means the motor's running a little bit too hot for me to be able to go to sleep. And I'm thinking about all the worst case scenarios that could be happening with my daughter. Is she making good enough friends? Is she doing w well with her finals week coming up? How is her job going? Is she moving forward? Is she loving Jesus? Like all the things I think about cause my palms to sweat and my heart to rate and it's hard to sleep and I feel stressed. And if I were to lay there in bed, unable to sleep and go, God, take away my anxiety. God, help me not feel this way. It would be very difficult because that is the appropriate feeling for what I'm thinking about. It's a response in a healthy, integrated personality. So what this text actually tells me I'm supposed to do is, okay, what are the things that I'm most worried about? I'm worried about her friendships. I'm worried about her work. I'm worried about all the dark, spooky things that are lurking in the corner as she walks home at night. I'm worried about her safety. So I start to pray about those. And I take, and I come and I, God, I thank you for my daughter. I thank you for the way you're guarding her. I thank you that you love her more than me with thanksgiving. I thank you that you have given her amazing friendships. God, I thank you you've given her discernment. And Father, I ask you, petition, that in the name of Jesus, you would guard her friendships. Keep her from all unprofitable friendships. God, that you would bring her great friends. I'm talking to God about the thing that is causing me angst. And Father, I pray that you would guard her. I can't be with her. If I was, buddy, she'd be the safest person ever, but I'm not. So would you put angels around her who are even bigger than me yeah. and tougher than me? Put angels around her, guard her, watch her. I can't be there. God, would you be there? So I start praying those things, and this amazing thing happens. As I'm doing the action of trusting God about the things that I've thought through that I'm having difficulty and wish I could perform, but I can't. When I think about those and I take the action of trusting God, the fruit of trusting God actually starts to infect my emotions. And usually somewhere in this prayer process, because I'm awake because I couldn't sleep, somewhere in that prayer process, I usually fall asleep. <laughs> because my anxiety goes away. because I'm trusting God, which is an action about certain things which are heavy on my mind and I couldn't control anyway, and I bring those two together and my mood meets me there and my anxiety's lifted. Now, how does that happen? How does this work? I have no idea. I don't know how it works. I don't know why it works. I don't know why God made it that way. But take a look at verse seven, if you would, if we could put that up. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. 
I have no idea why it works that way. It just does. I don't have to know. That's God's job to know. I don't have the capacity to understand why and how. I just need to know that. So the peace of God, which I can't figure out how to get in my own life, God figures out how to get it when I just choose to behave and think in accordance with his word. Isn't that crazy? And look what it says. The peace of God, which surpasses my ability to know how it gets there, will guard your heart's emotional center and your mind's, the way I'm thinking, through Christ Jesus. Now, the word there, guard, means to stand sentry. It's, it, it, it's, it's like SEAL Team 6 standing outside of Fort Knox. It guards. What, what does a guard do? There's banks all over your city. What is the guard doing? The guard is keeping out that which would disrupt, which is valuable. Simultaneously, the guard is keeping in that which is of great value. And look what this passage says. As I will pray, do. As I will think, God, what are the things I'm not trusting you in? And then I will, will marry those two together. The peace of God will stand sentry over my heart, my emotions, and my thoughts, and will keep out anything which would come in and disrupt, and will keep in that which he put there beyond my ability to understand, and the one who guards it is Christ himself. Wow. Come on. That's awesome. Yeah. Yes, it is. Amazing. How much of that did I contribute to my own well-being? None. <laughs> I'm just a follower of Jesus, following him by faith in what he says and how he wants me to think, and he takes care of how I feel. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's easy for the Apostle Paul to say. <laughs> he could never have imagined 2024 in New York City. <laughs> he could have never conceived the busyness of our lives. Paul could have never understood the pressure of trying to get your kid into just the right kindergarten. <laughs> he could have never understood the pressures and stress of finances in a city like this. He could never have comprehended the influence of social media. He could never have, have fathomed traffic in Midtown. He never had to live through another election cycle. <laughs> And that's true. That's true. Paul would have no frame of reference for what your life is like today. But he knows God and he knows humanity and while he doesn't know what traffic in Midtown is, he wrote these words while sitting in a prison cell. Unjustly. And he's writing from that prison cell to a church in the city of Philippi that he started in Acts chapter 16 in the middle of a full-blown riot. Hmm. And during that riot, he and his buddy Silas got arrested in that city. And Acts chapter 16 says that they were in the bottom of the jail. That doesn't mean like a finished basement. <laughs> you heard the expression that <clears throat> stuff runs downhill. That's how it works in a prison with no plumbing. Whatever happens above you rains down on you in the bottom. So we have Paul and Silas who were beaten, flogged, in the middle of a riot, sitting in the bottom of a prison cell with open wounds and all kind of stuff. And in that space, you might be familiar with the story in Acts chapter, Acts chapter 16, Paul and Silas chose to do what he tells us here in this passage to do, they rejoiced. Remember that? Yeah. They started worshiping in the wee hours of the night. Pitch black, they can't see anything. They start worshiping. They're taking an action despite being in a very stressful place. An action to rejoice. And do you remember what happened? The passage says that the entire prison shook and that all the doors flew open. 
Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I can't prove this theologically, but I, I think this is true. I don't think God opened the door to break Paul and Silas out. I think he was breaking in. And I can't help but wonder that those words that Paul wrote now in retrospect to the Philippian church, he knew in real time, sitting in the bottom of that Philippian jail, what it is for God to come to him in an incredibly stressful situation and stand guard over his peace. <laughs> There's nowhere God can't find you. There's nowhere he can't interrupt the cycle of stress and anxiety and bring you peace, even if he's got to bust into a prison to find you. <laughs> Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue... And if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Do you feel that challenge toward the way you think? Meditate is not just to kind of, like, it is to ponder the depths of. To just sit in and contemplate and to think about and let these thoughts wash over your mind. Let me ask you a question. How many of you, look, I mean, this is an incredible list. How many of you get anxious when you think about what is true and noble? Yeah, me either. <laughs> How many of you get anxious when you think about what is just and pure? How many of you get anxious, your anxiety spikes, when you think about that which is lovely? Right. <laughs> or good, virtuous, and praiseworthy? Hmm. You don't. It's kind of hard to get stressed when that's what you meditate on. Right. So Paul's saying, here's a way to think all the time. Fix your thinking on these, church. And then he concludes with this thought, the things which you learned, action, and received, an action, and heard, an action, and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Think on God's word. Do the very actions you see Christ doing and Paul doing. Think like this, do like this, and the God of peace will be with you. This is what's crazy. He says, first, you'll have the peace of God, but you're going to get the peace of God from the God of peace. It's not something he gives you. It's a fullness of him coming into a situation and transforming it with who he is, overriding what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. Wow, sorry. <clears throat> when you apply this passage to your behaviors, to the way you think, when you apply all the words of scripture to your behaviors and to the way you think, your mood will meet you there. And it will look like the mood of heaven as your behaviors and your thoughts look like heaven, your mood will meet you there. I'm going to pray for you for two seconds. Father in heaven, may the peace of God and may the God of peace be with my brothers and sisters. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>